Mr. Thomas, after South Sudan's independence in 2011, the country plunged into a bloody civil war in December 2013. Thousands have lost their lives. More than one and a half million people were displaced. How did this conflict break out? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. I, I guess uh, the country had inherited many, many contradictions from a, a long 20th century and a long 19th century. Um, and uh, the country had become really since the 1980s and in some ways since the 1950s, it had become a war zone, a very where 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 um, the the state uh, based in Khartoum had uh, had been a party to a very very lengthy conflict. So one of the things that happened uh, was that the development was configured around conflict, around war, a bit like development in, in Europe many centuries ago, was ch social change happened through violence. And I think that that was, that was one of the reasons why it was hard to kind of conjure up a state that could do things um, very peacefully um, in, a, in the short time that was available. One of the big problems, I think, was that the uh, state um, didn't have much to do with society. Like in, in, in our countries, the state works by, by engaging with the money system and the private property system and, and, and the, the, the economy, economic life of ordinary people and, and taking funds from it and, and, and building itself on, 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 on those resources that are pro the productive resources of society. But in South Sudan, there had been war for many years. The state was paid for from, from grants to, uh, from Khartoum to the military, and it had no relationship with the subsistence economy of everyday people. And so the people in the state lived a different life altogether from, from ordinary life, and they ended up fighting over the surpluses that they were able to generate. And one of the things that happened, one of the reasons why independence happened, was that they had these huge big surpluses coming out of the oil oil industry that emerged in, in Sudan from about 15 years ago. And South Sudan had a lot of money from oil, but the, the money went straight to the political class and they started fighting over it. What is the current situation and who are the victims? Um, well, there's lots and lots of victims. Um, the, the, the conflict erupted very surprisingly, taking many, many observers aback. Um, during a crisis in the in the the ruling party that in, during a, uh, their meeting in Juba in December 2013, and immediately uh, as a result of that crisis, there was a lot of fighting in the capital Juba, which app where apparently uh, members of uh, one ethnic community were being targeted by forces aligned to the president, um, and. Of course, there's a lot of controversy about the, 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 the events of, of those days, but um, it led to people from that ethnic community rushing out of, the, uh, out of Juba to their, to their areas of origin. In Jongale State, in Upper Nile State, in Unity State, the north and east of the country. Um, and those areas then became the site of a of, of, of a of renewed violence. Um, those areas had actually never settled down after independence. Um, independ uh, independence came in 2011. Uh, a new political order began in 2005 with a peace agreement in South Sudan. Um, but those areas had, had seen quite a lot of instability. The, 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 the problems that they'd inherited from the war had not really uh, come to a conclusion. And so it was very, very easy to mobilize a lot of people for battle from those areas. Within three days, um, the, the rebels had taken over a huge amount of territory, um, which was a very surprising thing to happen in any country, that you can get a revolution off the ground, holding territory within three days. It's a, it shows how many problems and how, much, uh, how many crises were being lived out by people there that they could take to arms so quickly. What is the current situation? 
Well, uh, there are there's uh, inconclusive peace talks between the the two camps. One of them is led by the President Salva Kiir uh, in Juba, and the other is led by for, former Vice President Riek Machar, who holds territory in the north and the east of the country. Um, they are um, involved in peace talks in Addis Ababa. Um, regional organizations and regional powers are involved in, you know, um, global diplomacy has been mobilized for it, the UN is involved and so forth. But there's been no uh, real successes. There's been a series of agreements that are forgettable because they, they, they get superseded by violence so quickly. Um, there's an offensive going on in Unity State at the moment. A lot of people have been fleeing in the last few days um, from the fighting. Um, and there's perhaps a bit more stability in, in Bor. Bor is the capital of Chongolay State, where which was one of the first casualties of the violence in December and January, December 2013 and January 2014. But it's maybe settled down a bit more there. The peace talks led by the regional organization EGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, seem to have reached an impasse. What are the chances of finding a short-term solution to end the ongoing fighting? It's very painful to say this, but I don't think a short-term solution is, is really on the horizon at the moment. It's very sad to say this because Uh, people in South Sudan have lived through an awful lot of trouble and conflict and poverty and it's very sad to think that the, the conflict um, in the north and the east of the country is set to continue. Um, but at the same time, um, the peace talks have so far been based on the assumption that the two uh, political rival political leaderships can somehow effect a reconciliation and then go back to sharing power. And in a way, part of the problem that the country had was the nature of the political elite, uh, its rivalrousness, its, um, its inability to work together uh, on a national agenda. And I think that probably much deeper thinking needs to be done before South Sudan can move forward. Although, of course, I would, be, I would greatly welcome any end to the conflict. In your new book, South Sudan, A Slow Liberation, you are presenting an analysis of South Sudan's history and present. What are historical roots of conflict in South Sudan and why is the violence so persistent? Well, South Sudan is a very interesting country. It was, in some ways, it was the first uh, part of the African interior to be incorporated into the international system because of the Nile. Because people could get down the Nile by 1840, they'd kind of getting near to the source of the Nile by the 1860s, they got there. Um, that's to say Europeans got there. The international system got there. Um, um, that meant that the riches of Africa's interior were suddenly seen to by a, by a, a vast audience across the world. And Uh, the, the, the economy of Africa's interior began to be integrated into the world economy at great disadvantage. So the, really the, 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 the start of that integration was firstly, first about trying to get ivory from people, but people didn't use money and so they needed, when, when, when it's not possible to get people to sell things, um, states and, and merchants use coercion. Uh, they can't, because people won't part with, with things. They don't want, they don't have the same system that we have of always wanting to produce more and have economic growth. They, they have subsistence systems without money. And so um, in the 19th century, uh, the experience of, mo of modern economic life was a deeply, deeply coercive in experience summed up in the slave trade which kind of really overtook the whole, nearly all of the country in that period. Um, so a very harsh incorporation in the 19th century 
into the international economy was followed by a very strange colonial experience in the 20th century where it was decided that the value of South Sudan was really its water resources and natural resources and the diplomatic capital that could be gained by controlling them. Uh, by controlling the Nile, you were able to pressure other countries that depended on the Nile. And so the country was closed off, the area was closed off to the outside world and deliberately de-developed. So after a very harsh form of development, you had a deliberate de-development which left uh, South Sudan in a very paradoxical situation. The first part of, inter of the African interior to um, to become a part of the of the global system, and also the most hyper underdeveloped part of the African interior as well, because of its experience of colonialism. And then once independence came, um, South Sudan became part of a state headquartered at Khartoum. It had been part of that state, but it became part of an independent state uh, headquartered at Khartoum. The, um, it had been cut off from Khartoum for many years because of this strange strategy of keeping it a closed area. Uh, and suddenly it was supposed to be pulled into this, this state system. Now, of course, African countries in the 1950s and 1960s sought a unified national ideology, a, a kind of nationalism that would help uh, these new countries uh, um, navigate their way out of the colonial uh, impasse that they'd got themselves into. And unfortunately in Sudan and South Sudan, the way that the, the cartoon state tried to incorporate South Sudan was, was again very coercive and trying to push the culture an idealized version of the culture of, 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 of northern Sudan and the Mediterranean. They tried to make that into South Sudanese culture and that didn't work. That sparked off a lot of, of, of crises in South Sudan uh, and a lot of repression was used against the South Sudanese. Um, and so there are, there, are, there are lots of factors behind uh, violence in South Sudan. Some of it is to do with, with, with relationships, with, with neighboring areas, some of it is to do with culture, a lot of it is to do with, with the economic system that, that, that it has. Um, and then war took its own logic after a bit. So from the 1980s, the war just went on and on. So people would say it was the longest war in Africa. In, and, it, and it was really one of the very longest wars in civil wars in Africa and it seems in a sense not to have stopped for very long before starting again. So sometimes because progress and development and change become configured around war, it's hard to kind of stop the war from, from rolling forward. What kind of political development is needed for a peaceful and democratic future of South Sudan? I think that's a really difficult question at the moment. Um, I think, well, let me give an example of the, of the, political, uh, the political project that South Sudan's uh, leaders um, proposed when they started to take power of the country in 2005, because in 2005 there was a peace agreement signed and and for the first, for, for, and, and the, the leaders of the South Sudan, Sudan, Sudanese rebel movement, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, took over the state. And um, what they decided to do um, as their, their national project was to build a huge army, the third largest army on the African continent um, in a, a country with a relatively small population. And in that army, would be they would bring together all of the soldiers from all of the different militias and, and armed forces that had been fighting in South Sudan for the past 20 years. Um, and at the time, people thought, well, maybe this is a very, very expensive thing to do, but maybe it's a kind of wise thing to do as, as well, because it, it, it means that all the potential troublemakers in the country are given a salary and are given a job and and uh, given a, some kind of purpose in life. Uh, looking back, that was obviously the wrong way to go because the crisis that happened happened within the army. Different groups within the army um, 
uh, were, were and, and within the security forces were set against each other, and and a hu and massacres ensued, and a rebellion uh, took shape very very quickly. Um, so I think, in a way, South Sudan might exemplify um, the state in Africa as a kind of security state, a security heavy state, a neoliberal state with a powerful security. Uh, force uh, uh, that, 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 that runs everything um, and I think it needs to find another national project if uh, as South, many South Sudanese politicians believe the nation state was the answer to the problems of marginalization and conflict in South Sudan I think a national project which is not about the military needs to be found maybe a national project around health or education or infrastructure where all of these huge productive energies of the South Sudanese people are given a peaceful direction. One of the problems in the peace agreement was that there was a lot of talk of what is called DDR, demobilization, disarmament, and, uh, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. DDR is about individual soldiers returning to villages or that's the that's the idealized image of it but what was needed was disarmament of people giving you know stopping having a militarized system and having a peaceful system a system that put objectives like education or health at the forefront of 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 the state's uh, role rather than seeing control and m managing uh, economic integration into the world economy as the state's principal role and unfortunately that's what happened in South Sudan that the state put the army and the oil trade as its central concerns. Any future prospects though? How, what do you think? Where will the journey go from now on? Well I spent February in South Sudan and I was working in a village um, near the Ugandan border I uh, walked home at night in the darkness, um, you know, maybe a mile down the road. Um, every bit, everything was extremely peaceful. I never saw any guns. There are parts of South Sudan which are not engulfed in violence, that are not sort of burning all the time. There are parts of South Sudan where um, people People are very disappointed and saddened and demoralized by what's happened to their country. They take it personally sometimes because they feel we, we had this chance. It wasn't they had this chance, we had this chance. And this chance seems to be passing us again and we're, our country is not working out as we wanted it to work out. But in, alongside that demoralization and sadness, there are lots of people are trying to make life work for themselves. Uh, and I think uh, there's lots of positive energy in, 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 in South Sudan. Um, I, when I was writing the book, I was also working as a human rights investigator in Syria, uh, which is another country that I had a lot to do with in my life. And in a way, it was the, one of the contrasts for me was how, how, uh, how, how, how terrible the situation seemed in Syria, how, how, how irretrievably broken things were in Syria. Um, for all of the problems in South Sudan, one never, you never felt that it was irre, you know, irre, irretrievably broken, that there was there's something that will definitely come back from South Sudan.